everyone today we're talking about hedonic or preference testing in sensory analysis and this is actually a, an edited video you may have seen this video before and said wait a second the sound is horrible so I'm working on fixing that today for you um, but hedonic or preference testing so much of sensory that we've spent uh, up to this point has been focused on the technical attributes of the food product and um, we did talk about focus groups and thinking about some of the attitudes and behaviors surrounding food. Now we're really delving into how much people like a food product. And really that is such a critical question for food scientists that we understand when we're developing a new product, how much people are going to enjoy it. And so there's a few different uh, sensory techniques that we're going to delve into and have some fun exploring today. So at the end of this video, oh, it's a part one video. We get a second one where we're going to talk about some data analysis uh, techniques as well. But at the end of this video, you'll be able to define the role of hedonic testing in product development processes. And we'll define the correct hypothesis testing for a couple different uh, methods, just about right, Likert and preference, and structure questions appropriately based on the hypothesis that we're working with. We're going to know what's required for a basic hedonic sensory setup, including the tray setup, labeling, and questionnaire scorecard. We'll also talk about how many people are typical for the, the type of analysis that we're doing. We'll read the scorecard and interpret the individual result. And we'll interpret hedonic scores to be able to make formulation recommendations. And there will be a part two for this video series where we talk about some of the basic data analysis. Again, this is an introductory course to um, sensory analysis and um, consumer studies. And for those of you who are really excited about what you're learning, there are more advanced courses with much more advanced statistical models. We take a really practical approach here in that there are accredited methods that have a lot more complexity. And those are used by scientists and researchers who really need to have um, criticality on their data. And then within the industry, oftentimes there's a little bit more relaxed approach that's taken. And I'm taking that second approach that we're a little bit more relaxed in our data analysis because there's a there's a bit of pragmatism that we need to be able to quickly perform some of these studies so that we can quickly get on to our goal which is commercializing food products having some data having some feedback using sensory will help us have a really high quality product so let's jump in here Hedonic testing is really all about asking that question, how much do people enjoy this product? And there's a few techniques that we're going to talk about today. There's more techniques out there, but today we're going to talk about rank preference. We're going to talk about Likert and we're going to talk about just about right. And these are all hedonic. Um, hedonism is the root word there. And hedonism just implies how you're enjoying it and gaining pleasure from it or preference testing that oh, which one do you prefer? And so these all have slightly different nuances that are important to be able to discern and interpret because um, there's there's pitfalls also behind each of these methods. And so you can't just go out there and, and use one and say, oh, well, I've got the best product out there. You need to understand the biases that each of these methods introduce so that you yourself aren't perpetuating those biases and instead you are working appropriately with them. So... Just about right tests are one of my favorite, and I know this slide is pretty wordy, but we'll walk through each of these points here. Just about right is one of my favorites because I'm a product developer and I want to know how much to dial up or dial down different attributes in my food product. So just about right, if you really think about the, 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 the premise of the question, how much of this flavor or how much of this attribute is there, is it too little or is it too much? And so the hypothesis is really that we've got a linear scale with, we either have far too much of the attribute, it's way too concentrated, maybe it's too salty, maybe it's too sour, maybe it's too much lemon flavor for all that matters. Um, we can decide what attributes are important within our food product and we can, we can use a scale in our just about right that has either far too little, 
a, a slightly too little, just about right in that central point, slightly too much or way too much of an attribute. Now, a typical, a, a typical setup for just about right testing is in the 25 to 50 panelists. But again, just about right is commonly used in R&D teams. And it, you're lucky in an R&D team if you can get 10 people to gather together and be able to um, evaluate your product. But uh, you do want to screen your participants for their ability to differentiate attributes. And can they name those attributes? So can someone uh, describe and properly um, indicate when they're tasting different flavors or smelling different flavors in that product or, or feeling different sensory properties, texture and crunchiness and so on. Um, the nice thing about Just About Right is that it's directional. And so you can quickly tell if you need to increase an attribute or decrease an attribute. And for the students that I'm training, they have enough culinary sense so that when they see there's too much of one attribute, they know to dial up or dial down that attribute. So too much, uh, too salty, well, we're going to reduce the uh, salt concentration that we're adding into that product. If it's not sour enough, we're going to increase the acidity by adding lemon juice or adding citric acid or, or, or so on. Not sweet enough, we're going to increase some sort of sweetener, whether that's a nutritive sweetener like sugar or non-nutritive sweetener like stevia or monk fruit or whatever we're formulating with. Um, the nice thing about Just About Right is that aspect of directionality. And we'll talk about Likert in a minute. Likert is really important as a survey tool, but it doesn't give direction. The limit on Just About Right is that it doesn't tell you how much people like it overall. And so it often is used in partnership with a Likert type questionnaire. We'll get to that in just a minute. The challenge too is that it's easy to lead your questions and generate bias about your product. And so you have to be really, really particular that when you're structuring your questions, you're not using leading type questions. And I know the students who are studying at Niagara College with me, I keep saying, don't use the word enjoy in any of your survey tools. Um, other thing about Just About Right, uh, it doesn't work well with negative attributes. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But you can't really say, oh, we don't have enough burnt flavor. Or we don't have enough uh, chemical aftertaste. And we need to add more of that. No, we're almost always we're trying to dial down those attributes. And so it doesn't work with negative attributes and you've got to use a different technique for that. Let's just jump out and, and think about why food scientists use this. Usually just about right is still being used in that product development process and it's for dialing up and dialing down attributes. So texture, flavor, aroma, color, all of these different attributes we know as, as formulation specialists, we can increase those attributes or we can decrease those attributes based off of the formulation and the processing that we're using. So it helps us understand the opinions about the product and the opinions about those attributes. And so we can decide where we are in terms of that formulation. I and mean, it helps us move forward the right preferred product with the right attributes for what we're after. And it's commonly used in mid-stage to end stage of prototyping. Now, uh, it often is that traditional sensory setup where you are presenting a sample in a, a hygienically prepared product format. You're going to typically be giving some sort of palate cleanser, so typically water and some crackers, but depending on the, the concept that you're working with, it could be other things. And obviously the right cutlery and the right score tool. Now, I will show you in a few minutes, on the, actually on part two, I'll show you some online score tools that we developed for doing some hedonic testing, and we'll do some analysis there. Now, here's our example jar questionnaire, and we've got just about right in the center point of this questionnaire, and we've got on one side of the axis, usually you start with too little on the left-hand side of the axis and too much on the right-hand side of the axis, and we've got a mirroring of this structure. So just about right in the center, slightly too, and slightly too, way too, and way too on both sides. And then I'm thinking about if I have chocolate chip cookies. Now, obviously, I would have some sort of um, informed consent document before I've got this questionnaire. I've made sure that people don't have allergies to chocolate chip cookies and they understand the risks and benefits of participating. 
and if there's going to be any compensation and, and any uh, communications pathways that are necessary with the management team that's working with us. But let's jump straight to the questionnaire. We've named the attributes that we want to look at. And so this list isn't exhaustive, but normally you would work in some sort of um, consensus and ideation uh, strategy with your R&D team. And you'd say, what are the attributes that are important? We will talk about CATA analysis, check all that apply, and we will do QDA, a descriptive analysis, quantitative descriptive analysis at a later point where you do uh, some of this building of attributes. But in general, you'll just go down the line and improvise a list and validate it with your own team. And that's what you're going to work with. Typically, too, when you're presenting that list, you're going to try and put it in the sensory order that you experience that the, those attributes. So if it's something that you see first and then you smell second and then you taste third, then you want to put those in the right order. In this case, I've just put some attributes here. So I've got browning, crispy texture, chocolate chips. They are all positive attributes about my chocolate chip cookies. So now let's imagine, oh, this is my chocolate chip cookie. And this is actually not even a chocolate chip cookie. It's a pretty lousy one because there's no chocolate chips. But let's imagine that was the prototype that we put out there. We go down that scorecard and we say, okay, We've got way too little browning. We've got slightly too much crispy texture. We've got way too little chocolate chips. <laughs> There's no chocolate chips at all. We've got just about right on our buttery flavor and our vanilla flavor, but way too little brown sugar. And maybe maybe that lack of brown sugar is why we've got not enough browning in that cookie. So we imagine you've got now 20, perhaps 50 participants filling out this type of questionnaire based off of their opinions and observations on that product. And we can present a second product and... Maybe this time we've got just about right on the browning, crispy, and chocolate chips. And maybe we've got a, not just a, a little bit too little buttery vanilla and brown sugar. Now, how is this data collected? Now, oftentimes it is through that typical sensory pass-through and you're, you're uh, setting it up. But oftentimes I've used just about right in scrums with R&D teams and We'll put out a tray on the table that we're working on in, in the center of the room and the R&D team will all grab a marker and someone will put on the board saying, let's just quickly note who is who is indicating just about right on this attribute or just too little too much. And the R&D team within the scrum, uh, just the gathering around at the front of the room, they'll quickly uh, shout out their answers and someone will document it on the board. And so... This is very frequently done on an informal basis rather than that paper-based questionnaire or converting that questionnaire into an online survey tool and done through the, the more formal sensory analysis method. Um, this is really, really rapid and it's, it's really great from an R&D team perspective and you really don't have a lot of setup that's needed for this type of, this type of um, analysis. Now, I will show you some of my survey tools that I've got, but you can imagine this was developed in Google Forms and we've got a survey tool where we could be pushing a cookie through uh, a normal sensory analysis setup with a booth and a, and a pass through door. And they've got a laptop or a, an iPad where they can do some sort of data collection on that survey tool. We're seeing more and more and more of these online surveys because it really facilitates the data collection. Now let's do some quick troubleshooting with uh, just about right. Now you can, I, I have seen it with a lot of students or a lot of R&D teams where they're trying to throw in negative attributes and just about right doesn't work well with, with um, just, uh, just about right type questions. How, uh, how would you do this? I've got way too little bitterness. I've got way too little burnt because I cooked my cookie properly. It doesn't make sense. And the just about right attribute doesn't make sense in this case. What we are looking at more is a Likert type questionnaire. So if we have issues with these negative attributes, one, we should, we should be avoiding them from the outset. But let's say, for example, artificial flavor may be a cost saving measure. We may be needing to evaluate it and it's better suited in a Likert. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's talk about Likert, actually. <laughs> just a moment is just about now. Um, Likert 
It looks like Likert, and I always say to the students, Likert is all about liking. And it really is about that question about how do you feel about this product attribute and its opinion and emotional, uh, emotionally centered. Or you can do an overall liking on that product. And you've likely seen these in survey tools. They're very, very common. And you've got a linear scale where you've got dislike extremely, dislike slightly, neutral, like slightly, like extremely. And oftentimes you've got a five point line, uh, depending on how, uh, how uh, serious you are about your survey tool, you could be going upwards of seven or nine different likings. But I find that five covers uh, the capabilities of most untrained panelists really well. Again, you've got typically 25 to 50 panelists. They're screened for their ability to differentiate flavors. And the nice thing is Likert is all about telling you how much people like something, but it doesn't tell you what direction you need to improve it. And so oftentimes this is paired with just about right because just about right gives you that sense of direction on the attributes. But then Likert is often thrown in at the end to say, how much do you really like this product? So let's just jump out here. And now we've got we've got the same paralleled structure. Now I've got a five point scale here. So one, two, three, four, five five headings on my columns, dislike extremely, dislike slightly, neutral, like slightly, like extremely. And I find that five points, uh, personally, when I'm dealing with untrained sensory analysts and minimally trained sensory scientists uh, who just need to quickly get some feedback, five points works really, really well. Again, some of the more scientific organizations will say five points isn't sufficient. You need seven or nine points. And that is indeed with some of those accredited methods. Um, I'm looking at that balance between ease of use of these survey tools, both from a user interface perspective and from a sign, uh, an, an analyst's perspective. And I've just uh, gravitated towards five points over the long term. So in this case, let's say we've got our chocolate chip cookie down here. We uh, pass our tray through to our panelist and the nice thing about this is now we are looking at opinion. We are looking at this right-hand tendency rather than central tendency. Just about right, we were looking for central tendency on our data on that just about right point. And in this case, we're looking at tendency towards this like extremely. And the panelist is going to go through and evaluate this product and tick off these boxes down the line. And again, Here's the one challenge when we're troubleshooting with it. Let's say I'm neutral about the browning on this. It doesn't give us a directionality. So we can't say, well, I'm neutral because I don't think it's brown enough, or I'm neutral because I think it's too brown, or chocolate chips. Maybe I dislike it slightly. It doesn't say anything about why I dislike it. Is it too many chocolate chips or is it too little chocolate chips? It doesn't give us any feedback on I dislike these chocolate chips because I think they are waxy versus a really, or they're, they're dark chocolate and I don't like dark chocolate, I like milk chocolate. Um, these, uh, this is why we are always talking about the fact that oftentimes one sensory analysis study leads to another sensory analysis study. And you may, you may find that you need to have a focus group or you need to have some sort of descriptive analysis as a follow-up. Um, but the nice thing about this is you can jump to that overall impression piece. And in this case, this like extremely is what you want. Now that said, there are products that are out there where you're looking at demographic seg segmentation. You may have chocolate chip cookies that are um, really liked by small children, but are not liked by adults and vice versa. You might have a really uh, delicious dark chocolate chip cookie with salted uh, salted chocolate on it, and it may not be appealing to small children, but it may be appealing to um, middle-aged women, for example. <laughs> you do need to look at some other, uh, sometimes demographic segmentation on this, because not all products are meant for all people. And so just looking at that total, like extremely, can be confusing. I remember doing a liquor uh, panel years ago on a beverage that we were that we were developing, and we had two groups very clearly and the, the data just split right down the middle between dislike extremely and like extremely. And 
it it was it was a polarizing product, but it was a product that in the end was was really unique and very meaningful to that that subpopulation that liked it extremely. And so you can't just look at the the net data. So there is some troubleshooting that you need to go through. We'll do some more in the data analysis part two on this video. The last, the last uh, hedonistic testing that we're going to talk about is uh, preference testing. And this one is is very, very common because it's quite easy to do. And this is where you're, you're ranking. If you've got two samples here, which is your preferred sample? Which do you prefer out of these two? If I said... Uh, tell me which is your preferred chocolate chip cookie. I'm going to assume that you like the one on the right hand side because it is the one with chocolate chips in it. But if you said which uh, which cookie do you prefer, perhaps I no I didn't say which type of cookie. Perhaps you prefer uh, vanilla uh, crinkly cookies here because maybe you don't like chocolate. Preference testing is tricky and sneaky, and you do need to be really careful about how you're structuring it. So. Let's, let's walk back through the those key questions here. Basic question on a, a preference or rank preference is which sample do you prefer or rank the samples in order of preference? So sometimes you'll have two or three. I don't recommend putting more than three uh, samples really. If you start to have way too many samples, I think of a, a, a tool that um, my nephew just showed me earlier this week and he had 19 things that he had to rank and it was just so confusing because after the first three or four you couldn't really rank anything and he had 19 things that he had to rank in that list it was just absolutely ridiculous keep it to three samples nah maybe you can push it to four i know again there are scientific principles and statistical principles that are out there from uh the more analytical sensory analysis people from a uh, pragmatic pr approach, keep it to three or four. Don't try and rank more. And the key hypothesis is which one do you prefer over the others? Again, typically you're going to see 25 to 50 panelists. I have seen people try to do rank preference in little tiny groups where you'll you'll present a, a, a sample to a group of investors and maybe there's three, four, five people in there. You do need to try and blind it um, so that you aren't showing your own cognitive biases towards this. And so having 25 to 50 panelists from the community that you're trying to target would be ideal. Obviously, you're going to screen them for the ability to differentiate and, and so on. The nice thing about this is it helps I identify which products are better. But what it doesn't do is it if you've got mediocre or lousy products, it gives this false sense of likability. And so you can walk out there with some crummy products and say, rank these for me. Um, and if you were to do the same products on a Likert scale, they may score uh, like slightly or not like slightly, uh, dislike slightly or dislike extremely. But if you want to rank two lousy products, you can find a better product out of the lousy products. It just, it gives you a false sense of, of which product's the better product. So you could put those two products out there and say, okay, um, category, uh, category, uh, these are out of order. Category one is the chocolate chip cookie here. Category two is the not so chocolate chip cookie here. Which do you prefer as our favorite chocolate chip cookie? And ideally you're going to have category one show up because it is the only chocolate chip cookie in this list. But for some reason, some people may be enjoying this product. It's quite often put in a pie chart or expressed as a percent of the population. Um, X percent of the population prefers product X here, the chocolate chip cookie with chocolate chips in it. Um, now, let's imagine here are our efforts making chocolate chip cookies. And these are photos of burnt cookies, some horrible stock photos of just uh, really bad baking jobs here. So now imagine I put out these two samples and said, I am giving you sample 127 and sample 883, and they are both burnt cookies. Which sample do you prefer, 127 or 883? And now it's forcing me to say, well, you know what, uh, 883, I can find a piece of cookie that isn't burnt, therefore it must be 883, but it's a lousy product. And now suddenly, if I were to put that same, uh, that same pie chart on top of this data, gee whiz, you know what? It often gives false hope to different 
um, R&D teams that this is an ideal product to move forward. And meanwhile, it, if I put a Likert scale on that cookie, you would say, I dislike it extremely because it's, it's burnt. It's burnt. And so be really, really careful when um, doing these sorts of analysis to not do them in isolation, but to really think contextually about the, the whole cycle of how these uh, different analyses can work together in an in a important way. So again, I always say try it out. And this is my, uh, my sort of my stock slide at the end. But do try it. Uh, honestly, the way you learn and the way you get to know a lot of the intricacy behind these sensory analysis studies is to just go out and do it. And so honestly, um, I'm going to encourage you to build some survey tools. Try it with your friends and family as you're cooking dinner uh, um, and ask the question, think about the different flavors in this rice casserole. Uh, what would you dial up and what would you dial down? Would, uh, tell me about the, the, the chicken flavor in my rice casserole. Should I have more chicken or less chicken? Um, these are the sorts of things that you can just build into your own conversation as a product developer to increase your vocabulary, but also then they can turn into survey tools. And that will be part two, where we dig into some of the survey tools and take a look at the types of data analysis that are quite common for uh, preference testing. All right, that's enough for this video. Take care, and we will talk to you again real soon.